Hello, you guys. What is up? Welcome back to another episode of Killer Instinct, and welcome to the very first episode of Halloween. 2021. If you are unaware of what Halloween is, Halloween is basically the killer instinct annual holiday where for the five days leading up to Halloween, we post a crazy true crime episode every single day. So from starting now until Halloween, you guys are going to get a new episode every single day. I was so excited reading your guys' comments on how excited you were when I announced that we were doing Halloween again this year. You guys love it. I love it. And and I cannot wait to jump in into this crazy first episode that we have. Today, we are starting this Halloween series off with a serial killer. Today, we are talking about Todd Kolhep. And this is one of those cases where I'm going to be telling you what happened and you are going to be sitting there going, there's no way that that is real. There's no way that that could have possibly happened. But here we are and sadly it is very very real. Todd is a serial killer who was convicted of murdering seven people in South Carolina from the years 2003 to 2016. Before we get started make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button that way you never miss an episode. We post weekly on the podcast every Wednesday and weekly here every Thursday and you are not going to want to miss it. With that being said, Let's jump right on into it today. Todd was born on March 7th, 1971 in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. However, he grew up in Georgia and South Carolina. He was born to his parents, William Samsel and Regina Taig. He was described as having a troubled childhood. Todd would try and steal other children's belongings, whether that was toys or school supplies, and he would take them and he would break them and throw them. His violence escalated to a concerning point when one time riding on the school bus, he ended up stabbing the girl that was sitting next to him in the legs with a pair of scissors. Todd was also violent towards animals. He would shoot dogs with BB guns and even kill goldfish with bleach. Now, Todd's parents divorced when Todd was two years old, and Regina ended up getting custody, and shortly after the divorce, she went on to marry her second husband. Now, Todd and his stepfather had a very tense relationship. Todd had a lot of animosity towards his stepfather, but Todd also ended up taking on his stepfather's last name. Even though Todd was now legally adopted by his stepfather, Todd really wanted to go and live with his biological father, which at this point he had not seen for about eight years. But with all the animosity and tension that was building in his house with his mother and stepfather, this is all Todd wanted. And Todd was willing to do whatever he had to do in order to make that happen. Now, something else to know about Todd is that he is extremely smart. He has an 118 IQ, which is well above average. Todd was also diagnosed with borderline personality disorder as a child. And from a very young age, as I've said from the very beginning, Todd had very erratic behavior and he ended up having to get counseling for this behavior. From a very young age, he was also obsessed with violent pornography. Now, Regina, Todd's mother, said growing up, it was very clear that Todd had anger issues and was very violent, but she got to a point where she didn't know how to help him. It seemed like his violence and his behavior was too much for her to handle despite all of her efforts and trying to put him in counseling. It became a lot of stress on her. And ultimately her and her second husband ended up divorcing in 1982. Now, while Regina was dealing with the divorce, Todd really didn't help in the sense that during the divorce and while Regina was going through that, Todd started threatening to kill himself. And the reason he threatened to do this was because he wanted to go and live with his biological father. He told Regina that if she didn't let him go, he was going to kill himself. So in the midst of that and the divorce that she was going through, Regina said, you know what? Okay, and let Todd go and live with his biological father, who at the time lived in Arizona. Now, Todd was really excited to be living with William, and this is really what he wanted all along, and he felt like he was finally going to experience that father-son relationship. He started going by the name Todd Samsel, which is William's last name, even though he didn't legally change it back. 
Now, William was a really big gun guy. He collected guns, he had a lot of knowledge about guns, and he passed this passion on to Todd. William taught Todd all about guns and was even teaching Todd about bombs and how to make them. Now, even though this initial father-son relationship started out strong and Todd was very happy, the honeymoon phase soon dissolved a little bit and William started moving on with his day-to-day -day life without always including Todd in it. William started dating some women and this made Todd very jealous. As you will see, throughout the course of this episode, Todd is someone who always wants the attention on him. He likes to be put on a pedestal. He likes to be favored. And when his father wasn't giving him that attention, it caused a lot of jealousy and rage in Todd. And it even got to a point where Todd started begging his mother to let him come home so he could live with her again. But Regina wasn't having it. She kept making excuses time and time again and reasons as to why Todd should stay longer, which ultimately only made Todd more upset. Now, Todd's first run-in with the law happened on November 25th, 1996 in Tempe, Arizona. Todd was 15 years old at the time, and he ended up kidnapping a 14-year-old girl by threatening her with a 22 revolver. He had her at gunpoint and took her back to his house where he tied her up, duct taped her mouth shut, and raped her. He then walked the girl back home to her house and threatened her by saying that if she ever told anyone about what he did, he would kill her little siblings. Now, it's not exactly clear who this girl ended up telling. However, someone of authority did end up finding out about this incident and they called the police, which led to Todd's arrest. Todd was charged with kidnapping, sexual assault, and committing a dangerous crime against children. In 1987, Todd pled guilty guilty only to the kidnapping charge and the other charges were dropped. His punishment for this was 15 years in prison and he also had to register as a sex offender. Now the judge in this case at the sentencing said that Todd was very academically smart, but he also said that Todd was emotionally and behaviorally dangerous, which at this point I think that was pretty apparent. To everyone. The judge said that even if Todd was to go to rehab, that wouldn't change anything about his behavior and that evidently he was probably going to be like this for the rest of his life. Now, Todd also had a probation officer and from this probation officer's point of view, he said that Todd basically acted like the world owed him something, which again goes back to what I said about Todd always wanting attention, always wanting to be put on this pedestal, always wanting things from people. Now, what's interesting about Todd's experience in prison is that for the first couple of years, he had some minor citations here and there. However, after he passed 20 years old, he basically got let off on good behavior. He didn't break any rules in the prison, and he was, for all things considered at that point, kind of a model prisoner. During his imprisonment, he graduated from Central Arizona College with a bachelor's degree in computer science. Now, after serving 14 years in prison, Todd was released in August of 2001, and he moved back to South Carolina, which is where his mother lived, and surprisingly began living a somewhat normal life. Now, because of his computer science background, Todd was able to get a job in Spartanburg, South Carolina as a graphic designer, and he worked there for almost two years. He worked there from January 2002 to November of 2003. In 2003, he started studying at Greenville Technical College and then transferred to the University of South Carolina Upstate in 2004. He graduated from there in 2008 with a Bachelor of Science degree in business administration marketing. Now in 2006, he ended up getting his real estate license. He ended up lying about the felony charge that was on his record and he was so good at lying and so good at manipulating that this felony charge was ultimately looked over and he was able to obtain his license. He essentially got out of this by saying that the felony charge was one big misunderstanding and the girl that he raped was his girlfriend and the parents didn't like him and it was this whole thing thing and ultimately 
they believed him, so they gave him his real estate license. And surprisingly enough, Todd ended up being a top-selling agent in the Carolina region, so he was pretty successful. His clients described him as being extremely outgoing and professional, but some had a different opinion. Some clients said that Todd talked a lot about his gun collection, he would throw in inappropriate sexual innuendos in conversations, and one client even described him as being a very angry and condescending man. Coworkers of Todd said that he had a habit of watching pornography for hours on the computer while at work, and it made everyone obviously very uncomfortable. Now, from the money that he earned from his real estate business, Todd ended up purchasing an 100-acre plot of land. He purchased this for about $305,000, and then once he purchased it, he paid to get a fence around the property, which cost an additional eighty grand. Now, for the most part, on the outside, it really seemed as if Todd was trying to get back to as much normalcy as possible. He had his real estate license, he was a top seller, he was getting his private plane license. However, that judge, when Todd was 15 years old, knew what everyone else didn't, and that was that Todd was never going to change. Learning a new language can feel intimidating. And when I first decided to give Italian a shot, I was worried about the level of difficulty, the time commitment, and having to hear how my accent sounded out loud. But thanks to Babbel, the number one selling language learning app, the whole process was addictively fun, fast, and easy. Whether you want to learn a whole new language for an upcoming trip or just as an engaging in a new hobby, Babbel teaches bite-sized language lessons for real world use. Now, I'm personally someone that just doesn't have the time to sit down for two, three hours in a week and learn a new language. And so that's why I really love Babbel. They have 15 minute lessons that make it the perfect way to learn a language on the go. And also, I will say, I was never good at learning languages in high school or middle school. It was always something that I really struggled with. But Babbel makes the experience so incredibly fun and engaging, and they make you want to learn. When I'm on Babbel, I want to learn more. Other language learning apps use AI for their lesson plans, but Babbel's lessons were created by over a 100 language experts. And their teaching method has been scientifically proven to be effective. Plus, Babbel's speech recognition technology helps you to improve your pronunciation and accent. Right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. That's six months for the price of three months. Just go to Babbel.com and use promo code KILLER. That's B-A-B-B-E-L dot com code KILLER. Babbel, language for life. Research now shows what we've known all along, that sleep affects everything. It affects your overall health, your brain function, your mood. It even affects weight loss. But a lot of us struggle with getting a quality night of sleep. And I'm talking about a full eight hours with no interruptions. We now know you just can't live your best life if you're not sleeping. I repeat, you cannot live your best life if you're not sleeping. Personally, for me, I've always struggled with falling asleep and staying asleep. I'm always waking up multiple times throughout the night, and it really affects the way that my brain functions in the morning, and it affects how quickly I'm able to get up in the morning. But Beam's Dream Powder is here to give you the best sleep of your entire life. It's triple lab tested and contains ingredients like melatonin and nano CBD. And why is nano CBD so innovative? Well, it's all about surface area. When you break CBD molecules down into tiny droplets, your body has dramatically increased the ability to absorb it. My problem with other melatonin-based products is that the next day, my brain is so foggy. It takes me so long to get out of bed. But once I started taking Beam's Dream Powder, I was able to get out of bed no problem the next day, still completely be productive and get everything that I need to do done. Now get the sleep of your dreams with Beam's Dream Powder. If you subscribe now, you'll get 35% off your first month of Dream. Plus, you can get a free mug and frother. Head to beamorganics.com slash killer instinct. That's B-E-A-M organics.com slash K-I-L-L-E-R-I-N-S-T-I-N. CT or head to beamorganics.com and enter the code killer instinct at checkout for 35% off your first month plus a free mug and frother. Pause or cancel anytime. Now let's talk about what happened on August 31st of 2016. So there was a couple named Kayla Brown and her boyfriend, Charles Carver. 
Kayla was 30 years old at the time and Charles was 32 and the two of them had been dating for a few months before they decided to take the next step in their relationship and move in together. Now, when they moved in together, they decided that they were going to be as financially responsible as possible. So in order to do that, they were both looking for extra kind of side jobs in order to make some extra money apart from their main jobs. Now, Kayla had actually met Todd a few years prior through an ex-boyfriend of hers. And when her and Charles were having this conversation about having side jobs, Kayla remembered Todd and remembered that he worked worked for this really successful real estate company. And she thought that Todd must have some sort of side job that she could pick up. And he absolutely did. Todd gave Kayla the job of cleaning up the houses that he would show before he would show them. So Kayla would go in, mop the floors, wipe off the counters, things like that, just to get the house all prepared for a showing. But this wasn't the only job that Todd offered. In fact, Todd told told Kayla that he had a job opportunity for both her and Charles. He ended up offering Kayla and Charles a job on his 100 acre property. This meant clearing out small trees, large plants, and really just trying to open up the land on the property as much as possible. Now, Kayla and Charles were really stoked about this because not only was Todd giving Kayla an opportunity to have a side job, now he's giving them both another job that they could do together. So this job for Kayla and Charles was supposed to start on August 31st, 2000. 2016. So Kayla and Charles both drove in Charles's car over to Todd's property. Now, Todd also had another house that he lived full time. It was his residential property that was about nine miles away from this 100 acre property. So Todd drove over from his house to meet Kayla and Charles there. Kayla and Charles met Todd at his property, and this would be the last time the two of them would ever be seen together again. After a couple of days went by and Kayla and Charles's family and friends weren't able to get a hold of them, they started to worry. Now, Charles usually talked to his mother on the phone every single day. However, she was calling him and it was going straight to voicemail. Friends of the couple were even going over to Kayla and Charles's home and leaving notes on Kayla's car, hoping that they would get them then. However, they weren't getting any responses from that either. After days were going by and their friends weren't getting any response, their friends ended up going inside of their house. And that is when the only thing they found was Kayla and Charles's dog. But Kayla and Charles were not there. This is when their friends knew that something was very wrong because there is no way that Kayla and Charles would have left their dog by himself for that long. After their visit to their home is when the authorities were called and a missing person report was filed for both Kayla and Charles. Now, when they were originally reported missing, no one had any idea where the two of them had went. They had no idea about this job opportunity that they had gotten from Todd. No one knew what happened. But then weirdly enough, there was some social media activity from Charles. Charles ended up posting on Facebook on September 6th. So this is just one week after they went missing. And Charles posted that him and Kayla were expecting their first child together and were now married, which by the way, this was not true. The two of them were not expecting their first child together. So you can imagine everyone's confusion with that, along with the fact that all of their friends and family have been trying to get in contact with them for days now, and they've gotten no response. His friends and family commented on the post with questions like, where is Kayla? What's going on? Are you two okay? And Charles was not happy about this at all. And if you're listening to me on the podcast, you wouldn't have been able to see that I just put Charles in air quotes. He fired back with comments that said, quote, who the fuck are you to be questioning me about my girlfriend, end quote. But the bizarre post didn't stop there. Charles kept posting weird pictures of swords and weapons. If you've been on Facebook before, I'm sure you've seen those pictures with just a blank background and text over it. And Charles posted one of those that said, quote, last thing I remember, I was running for the door. I had to find the passage back to the place I was before. Relax, said the nightman. We are programmed to receive. 
you can check out anytime you want, but you can never leave, end quote. Now, if that sounds familiar to you, that is because those are song lyrics from an Eagle song called Hotel California. However, that lyric in particular is very eerie when you connect it to a case like this. Now, Charles's friends and family were very quick to know that this was not Charles. Whoever was posting this was not Charles and more than likely was the person responsible for whatever had happened to them. So friends and family were commenting things like, is this what you did to Kayla and the real Charlie? Are you hinting at what you did to them? What did you do to them? The questions just kept on coming. It seemed like whoever was on the other end of these posts were posting deliberately to make Charles and Kayla's friends and family mad, to deliberately push their buttons. Then the person behind the Facebook posts went a step further, when on October 1st, they posted a picture of Kayla and Charles together, mind you, this was an old picture, captioned, we are fine. Now at this point, you as the listener have probably figured out who the person behind these Facebook posts was, and that would be Todd. Todd was the person that was pretending to be Charles on Facebook this entire time. However, no one knew that because no one knew that Kayla and Charles had gone over to Todd's property to work for him. So Todd was really hiding behind this facade of Charles. But let's talk about what happened the day the couple showed up to the property. So on August 31st, when Kayla and Charles showed up to the property, Todd had told them to drive up to where the garage was. This was a two-story garage and it was detached from the rest of the property and Todd had told them to meet him there. When they drove up, Todd was standing outside of the garage and told them to wait there while he went inside and grabbed something. So Todd walks into the two-story garage and shortly after comes out, whips out a gun, and shot Charles three times in the chest, killing him instantly. Now at this point, Kayla knew that she could not run. She knew that she was trapped. She knew that if she ran, Todd would kill her. That is when Todd came behind her and put her in handcuffs and placed her in a small shipping container where she would be held hostage. Now, Kayla's time with Todd was absolute hell. She spent all day in the shipping container except for the hours of 1 to 3 p.m. and 5 to 7 p.m. when Todd would come retrieve her every day at those times exactly. He would then take her to the two-story garage on the property and go on to the second story, which basically was his sex dungeon, and then he would rape her. The rest of the time, she was in the storage container handcuffed and only allowed to go to the bathroom once a day. She was also given a bucket of water to keep herself clean. Kayla looked for any opportunity to escape, but you have to remember, she's on an 100 acre property. It would take her a very long time just to get off of the property and the chances of being caught were high because of that. Now, throughout all of this time that is passing, the police are adamantly searching for Kayla and Charles. And while you would think that due to Todd's criminal record that he would be one of the first people looked at, He really wasn't. No one yet was thinking that the super successful real estate agent would be capable of something like this, even though he did have such a hefty criminal record on him. Now, Todd at this point was continuing to live his life as normal. He was going to work, he was living his life, and he was posting on social media like normal. But for Todd, the term normal is very different than what a lot of people would consider normal. And I'm going to read to you some of the status updates that Todd wrote during the times that he was holding Kayla hostage. On the 15th of September, he posted, quote, reading the news, this person's missing, that person's missing, another person's found with her parole violation boyfriend. In the event that I become missing, please note no one would take me. I eat too much and I'm crabby. They would just bring me back or give me 20 bucks for a cab ride. Most likely if I am missing, it's because my dumbass did something on that tractor again and I'm too stubborn to go to the doctor." End quote. 
Now, Todd's Facebook posts show that not only does he have a bizarre sense of humor, but it also shows that he has a sense of entitlement and that he always wants the attention on him at all times. It just goes to show from that. He talks about this person's missing, that person's missing, but then brings it back to himself. So at this point, it is a late October, early November of 2016, and Kayla and Charles have been missing for a couple months at this point and police finally were able to get a search warrant on their laptops. And when they did this, they were finally able to find the messages between Kayla and Todd about the job opportunity that Todd was giving them. And once they saw this message, this case cracked open. They finally then tried to ping Kayla and Charles's cell phones. And when they did that, they were able to see as well that the last ping on both of their cell phones was made on Todd's 100 acre property. Now on eight o'clock AM on November 3rd, 2016, the police finally decided to make their move. They arrived to Todd's residential property that was nine miles away from the 100 acre property. They then asked Todd if he knew anything about Kayla and Charles's disappearance, which he completely denied. But what Todd didn't know was at this point, police were already at his 100 acre property searching through and through for Kayla and Charles. Now, while they were searching the 100 acre property, they came across the two story garage. That was the first thing that they searched. And when they went into the two story garage, they were shocked at what they saw. They found shackles hanging on the walls. They found a deranged bed and they also found rope. They then went into the bathroom of the garage, which is where they found dark hair clippings. But still at this point, there was no sign of Kayla. So they continued to walk around the rest of the property. And this is when they came across the storage container. While they were approaching the storage container, they heard some noises coming from the inside of it. Police tried to open the door of the storage container. However, there were five different padlocks on this storage container. So police had to get the tools to remove the padlocks. And finally, they were able to open the door. When police opened the door, they found Kayla shackled by her neck, laying on top of a dog bed, handcuffed. She had been there for two whole months. And there is footage of Kayla being recovered. And I'm going to warn you because it is very unsettling and it's very graphic footage. However, it is astonishing to see how composed and poised Kayla is as she's getting rescued. So here is that clip. Just a girl, just a girl. Just How are you, honey? This we're is this, bolt cutters. This is our best. He's a paramedic. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. we're going to get you out of there, okay? Just hang loose for me. Anybody got a, I need a handcuff key. Handcuff key. I don't have I got a handcuff. Hold up. Y'all slide back. Hold on. He's, He's got, got a light. Get we got to let you get pictures. Get pictures. Randy, let, okay. let me see your light, Randy. You can, you can put your hand down. You're okay. We're here, okay? Y'all sit back. Light on or off? You're fine. We'll get the rest of it here. Let's get her out of here. We're getting bolt cutters, honey. Don't, don't. You got pictures of the cuts? No, pull them. Bolt cutters. both feet. Mm, just one. Let me see. Attached to a chain. Okay. Okay. And my neck's attached to the wall up here. Okay. All right. All right. We're going to get you out some more, okay? You got a hand cut, too. I got another one. I'm going to get my car. I got another one. I'm going to get my car. That. Bolt cutter. Just hit, hit the chain right there. Just, yeah. just no, just right there at her hand, Brandon. We'll, we'll get it off. We'll get it off here. Cut it right here. Do you know where your buddy is? Charlie? Yes. He shot him. He shot him? Who did? Todd Colehep shot Charlie Carver three times in the chest, wrapped him in a blue tarp, put him in the bucket of the tractor walked me down here i never seen him again okay. he says he's dead and buried he says there's several bodies dead and buried out here and he okay. says that the dogs will be ruined if they go looking because there's red pepper we're gonna step you up sweet look because there's what red pepper okay. Okay. tell the dog people that as you can hear in that clip, Kayla told authorities that Todd had shot Charles and wrapped him up in a blue tarp and buried him on the property. She told authorities that Todd told her that he had buried multiple
bodies on this property and that police weren't going to find them because he had red pepper on his property. Now, the significance of the red pepper is red peppers can be used to throw off cadaver dogs because of their scent and because the fumes from them can sometimes irritate the dog's eyes. So that was the purpose of Todd telling Kayla about the red peppers. Kayla also admitted to authorities that Todd made it very clear to her that she was only there for his sexual gratification. And if she wasn't going to fulfill that for him, then he was going to shoot her. Todd also told Kayla that he did not believe in rape so she would not be able to ever say that he raped her. Todd even went to the extent of telling Kayla that she would eventually get Stockholm Syndrome, which if you are unfamiliar with Stockholm Syndrome, Stockholm Syndrome takes place when someone who is held hostage creates a psychological bond to their captor. He also admitted to Kayla that his dream was to be a serial killer and to get his kill count into the three digits. He told Kayla that if she was good for him and good to him, that the two of them could become a Bonnie and Clyde killing duo and that they could do this together. Todd also told Kayla that he was planning on killing another girl very soon and her name was Holly. Now, Holly was someone that is still alive, luckily, and that Todd had a very casual fling relationship with and Todd had admitted to Kayla that that was the next person that he was planning on killing. Now, while all of this is going on and while Kayla is admitting all of this to the authorities, Todd is at his residential property with detectives, still thinking that he is one step ahead of them. But meanwhile, authorities know everything. This is when authorities sit Todd down and tell him that while they were with him at his house, they issued a search warrant on his other property and that they have Kayla. Now, Todd's face is absolutely shocked and he answers this by saying, excuse me? And then police continue to inform him that they are also aware that he shot Charles. And right now, I'm going to play the clip of police confronting Todd about what they knew. While we were here, all right, my sergeant served a search warrant on your property. Okay? We have Kayla. We have Kayla in your property. She was locked in a container. Okay? She has told us that you shot and killed Charlie. Okay, so at this time, I'm gonna need you to stand up and put your hands behind your back. You're under arrest. Okay, you're under arrest right now for kidnapping. All right, they're gonna continue to search your property. They're gonna continue to bring, they got cadaver dogs down there. Okay, if you wanna help yourself, tell me where Charlie's at so we can go find his body. That's, that's pretty much where we're at right now. Okay. Do you want to help me yourself and tell me where the body's at so we can go recover Charlie's body? No, sir. You don't want to? No, sir. Okay. Why did you shoot him? I didn't shoot him, but sir. Okay, why did you lock her in a container in your property? I was talking about. She's on your property right now, locked in a container. They just got her out of a, like a, um, they call it a shipping box. Conics box. Conics box. She was locked in a container in a comments box. They got her. We are, we have investigators. We have like 20 investigators on your property right now. And they have found her in the comments box. So she never left your property. Okay, you locked her in the comments box and she has told investigators that you shot and killed Charlie. Okay, so I'm trying to give you an opportunity to help yourself and help us help you find this body because Charlie, she's saying Charlie's body, you buried Charlie's body on that property. So you're saying you didn't lock her up, you didn't put her in the comics box or anything. I'm money in the 
Um, probably a good thing. Several days after the arrest on November 6th, Todd took authorities back to his property where he showed them where two other bodies were hiding. These bodies would be 29 year old Johnny Coxie and 26 year old Megan McCraw Coxie. This couple had also gone missing soon after they were hired to work on Todd's property. They went missing in December 2015, so a little less than a year before. Before Kayla and Charles went missing. In an autopsy revealed that Megan died from a gunshot wound to the head. However, she had been kept alive for six days before her death. Johnny also died from a gunshot wound to the chest. But let's talk about the interrogation. This interrogation is going to walk through Megan and Johnny and what happened with them. And then we are going to move on to Kayla and Charles. And I'm going to play several clips from this interrogation for you guys to hear for yourself the narcissism and crazy insanity that comes out of Todd's mouth. So first we are going to play the initial clip of Todd speaking of how he met Johnny and Megan. You picked me up at Blackstock, and, and you know what? You picked me up at Blackstock and Regal Road, I think you said, and then that's, well, okay, no, let's sure. start. I met her there. Okay. Got her number. We talked on the phone for a brief moment. Okay. Then I met them later on at that next to Ricky's Hot Dogs Beach parking lot. They walked across okay. and spoke to me there. Okay. I almost thought she was going to hit on me to actually, come on, I should have known that was in our car. Um, but just not what I was there for. I got you. I'm going to tell you, our meeting would change shit. <laughs> I understand. I mean, I got you. Told you show up with, with that. In that parking lot? Yeah, in her kind of the way she was. I understand what you're talking about. Um, basically, offered her the job, offered to let him go in and do it, come work as well. The next day, she was, the next day, this was over several days. The next day, she was in the paper, mugshots. I guess you guys had arrested her for um, meth or some uh, hair, I don't know. Something was in her bloodstream, and you took her kids away. Okay. I asked her about it, and she informed me, yeah, she had drug issues, and with that. Okay. I still was going to give him a chance. Got him down to my building, and that's when Johnny pulled a knife out, mm -hmm. and you shot him. I shot him. What did you do with his knife? I don't know. I'll keep it on crap. You just threw it out? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. I, what did she do when you shot Johnny? What did she do when Johnny pulled the knife out? What did she say? Nothing. So you think she was playing on the plane of this? I think she entirely was in the plan. Okay. There was there was no oh yeah. uh, Johnny, what are you doing? There was mm -hmm. none of that. There, this was her actions were she knew he was doing that. Mm -hmm. They saw a guy who had a lot of money, mm -hmm. a car they can't afford. Mm -hmm. They didn't even have a car. And they were gonna get something. So then you shot him how many times? Shot him twice. Okay. In the chest. Okay. He dropped forward. Mm -hmm. He dropped forward. I went around him and put another one to a spinal column. Now, as you can tell from this clip, Todd basically frames himself in this hero complex almost, that he had found Johnny and Megan after they were arrested, they were on drugs, he was coming in to save the day and give them an opportunity. He said that Megan wanted him sexually, Megan was hitting on him, and then Johnny so happened to pull out a knife, and that's why. Todd shot him. He was going into detail about how they were after Todd for his money and that how they targeted him, which is insanity. And he eerily goes into detail about how he shot Johnny twice in the chest and then went around and shot him in the back. Now, before I play this next clip, I do want to say that you're going to hear Todd talk about a Connex box, and that Connex box is the storage container. That is the same thing. So when you hear the term Connex box, that is what he was referring to, and that's also the same storage container that he kept Kayla in. Let's roll the clip. Did you shoot her? No, at that time. Okay, what happened with her? She panicked, but then she said, I told her to sit down. She sat down. Mm -hmm. Uh, went ahead and cuffed her, mm -hmm. patted her down, mm -hmm. told her I wasn't going to hurt her. Mm -hmm. uh, she calmed down, mm -hmm. and I actually took her to the Connex. No, that's not true. I had her lay there for what I didn't have to do with her. 
Um, I did one in my comics because I had stuff in there and what the hell to do with it. Mm -hmm. Putting her in with my guns is not a big deal. No, I don't understand that. Uh, and she had to go. For the first time I ever handled up a pay because what the hell do I do there? Mm -hmm. uh, put her here, put her there, drop her, what the hell do I do? Do I call the cops? I got legal guns. I told her I wasn't going to touch her. It was a tour. Uh, she calmed the like hell down and let me sort of get out. Mm -hmm. Somewhere between, I did that, I, I shot him, set the back, tight in the back, got her to calm down, and kept coming back and forth trying to figure out what to do, but I had her cuffed mm -hmm. and she wouldn't go anywhere. Eventually, I went and I want to say I left her on that floor for a while. I left her on that floor cuffed for a little bit because I didn't know what I'd do with her. I didn't want her in the building. Okay. Got the tractor, got it out of there, picked the body up, and the tractor was right there with it. This is Johnny's body? Yeah. Okay. Um, like I said, I was coming with a meltdown. And listen to how much more. Now, Todd actually goes into this interrogation with detectives and tells them that he was planning on letting Megan go. He said that his plan was to drive her up to Tennessee and to get her as far away from him as possible. And then he was going to drive back. He was going to drop Megan off, let her start her new life, and he was going to drive back. He said for two whole days, Megan was ecstatic and was so nice to him. Again, framing himself as this hero because he was doing such a nice thing for Megan after keeping her captive for weeks. So that was Todd's plan. So he said he was going to drop Megan off and let her go. However, something happened that got in the way of this plan. Now, you might be wondering what that is. And when I tell you, you might be confused. The one thing that Todd said got in the way of Megan being free was the weather. Yes, the weather. We're talking December in South Carolina. So Todd said that on the day that he was planning to drive Megan, there was a huge storm and that the roads were super icy. So because of that, he wasn't able to drive the hours that it would take to get her all the way to where he wanted to drop her off. So Todd said that he had to go tell Megan this. He had to go tell her that she couldn't go that day. And according to Todd, Megan flipped out and she actually tried to light the storage container box on fire. Again, this is the same storage container that Kayla was eventually held in. So Megan tried lighting the storage container on fire and Todd said that he ran in after her and tried to pull her out. But when he did that, he said that Megan was acting like a caged animal. She was going ballistic. And so Todd said that at that point, he had no other choice but to shoot her. Todd said that he shot Megan in the back of the head with the same gun that he shot Johnny with, which was ultimately the same gun that he shot Charles with. Todd even said that this wasn't his favorite gun. It was just his most convenient gun. It truly is wild listening and watching the interrogation of Todd because he is so willing to give all of these details to the point where it makes you question what is true and what isn't because he is so forthcoming. And throughout all of it, he puts himself on this pedestal that he ran after Megan to save her from the fire and that he did all of these things to try and accommodate to her and to Kayla. He truly is a narcissistic sociopath when you watch these clips back and when you're listening to them now. Now let's circle back to Kayla and the part of the interrogation that incorporates her. I'm going to play a clip right now because it truly is fascinating how Todd believes that he has pulled a fast one on the authorities. Like I said earlier, Todd told Kayla that he does not believe in rape. It just, it, he doesn't believe in it. I don't know how, but he is very adamant on the fact that he does not believe in rape and he is very adamant on the fact that he would not be charged for rape for any of these crimes. He said that every single sexual encounter he has ever had, not only with Kayla, but with everyone, has always been consensual. He said that Kayla even instigated some of their sexual encounters together. When police rescued Kayla out of the storage container, she had a collar, a metal collar that was chaining her 
to the storage container and Todd told authorities that that was her idea. He even went as far as saying that when he bought the collar, he thought that it was too kinky for him, but he went along with it because that's what she wanted. He told police that Kayla wanted to sleep on the dog bed that she was found on because it played into the whole dominant submissive kind of game that they had going on. And this is where it just, my mind is blown with this. Todd goes as far as to tell police that Kayla told him that Todd needs to give her permission to speak to him and to look at him. That every time Todd wanted to talk to her, Kayla told him that he needed to give her permission. And every time Todd wanted her to look at him, Todd needed to give her permission. He also references Ashley, which is his ex-girlfriend, and he mentions her in this clip, so that's who he's referring to. So let's roll that clip right now. She wanted the, 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 the comfort things on the floor. Mm -hmm. That was her idea. That was her submissive kitty bed, her kitty bed. Man, it's her damn. Also, I, I put the collar thing on her. And yeah, they found me, uh, they were like, what? they thought it was for a daughter, you know? Well, now the cage that was up there was in pieces, mm -hmm. that I built, and it was originally meant for my dogs. Yeah, no, I'm talking about the, the car, the, the metal car thing you told me about. That I ordered mm -hmm. off of one of the websites delivered, and I got it, because she, she requested that as opposed to me putting the chain around. Mm -hmm. And I got that and went, hmm. I, I went, Okay, I don't want nothing to put it. Uh, but she wanted that and then the, the, the key bit. And she wanted this whole thing of explaining to me that I had to give her permission to speak to me, mm -hmm. give her permission to look at me. Mm -hmm. Dude, I'll do all that girl. Uh, you know, I'm like, ask Ashley. Ashley's never had to deal with any of that crap. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was just, I don't know, she, 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 she had all this stuff, she kept asking for this kind of stuff, I got it, and she wanted it, it's a big black book, about that deep, mm -hmm. $23 that damn book, <laughs> and it's the Enchanted Sorcerer, Sorcery, so mm -hmm. it's the how-to guide to be a witch. Dude, I just figured she'd read the damn book, she put them off. Kayla has before asked me to beat up people for her, or use my resources, which she thinks my resources are go get someone killed. Really? Yeah. With people that she doesn't like. A, he had, they have you do or have you hired somebody to do it? Yes. Both? Yes. Now, at this point in the interrogation, we hear Todd talk about his equipment. He talks about the storage container box, which he said that he didn't originally get for kidnapping purposes, but at first it was for his guns and for food. He also said that he has a lot of cable wires and shackles that were not originally used for kidnapping purposes, but it just so happened to turn out that way. Now, you might be sitting here wondering why Todd is considered by some as the Amazon review killer. Well, that would be because Todd went out of his way to do the unthinkable, as if all of this wasn't the unthinkable already. But Todd was purchasing a lot of equipment on Amazon. But he wasn't just purchasing this equipment on Amazon, he was writing full on reviews for it as well. On the master padlock that kept the storage container shut, he wrote a review on September 13th, 2014 that said, quote, solid locks have five on a shipping container, won't stop them, but sure will slow them down till they are too old to care, end quote. On a Pentagon fixed blade, he left a four star review saying, quote, haven't stabbed anyone yet, yet but I am keeping the dream alive, and when I do, it will be with a quality tool like this, end quote. On another master lock, he wrote a review that said, quote, works great. Also, if someone talks back, go old school on them by putting this in a sock and beating them. They will not appreciate the hardened steel like you will, end quote. On a shovel, he said, quote, Keep in the car for when you have to hide the bodies and you left the full-sized shovel at home. Does not come with the midget, which would have been nice, end quote. On a chainsaw, he wrote, quote, works excellent. Getting the neighbor to stand still while you chase him with it is hard enough without having an easy to use chainsaw. End quote. Now what's terrifying is that I'm sure that when people saw these reviews on Amazon, 
They thought that it was probably someone with just a very twisted sense of humor. And while Todd does for sure have a very twisted sense of humor, he more than likely was very truthful and honest in these reviews on what his intentions were with them. Now, while Todd was being interrogated by the detectives, they knew that they were having him confess to the three murders of Megan, Johnny, and Charles, as well as the kidnapping of Kayla, all of which he confessed to. But what they didn't No, was they were going to be hearing a confession from Todd about a quadruple homicide that happened 13 years earlier that was still unsolved. On November 6th, 2003, there was a customer who walked in to a motorcycle shop called Superbike Motorsports. This was located in Chesney, South Carolina, and when this customer walked in, he was stunned to find the bodies of four employees of the shop shot dead on the floor. These employees were the owner of the shop, 30-year-old Scott Ponder, the 30-year-old service manager named Brian Lucas, the 26-year-old mechanic named Chris Sherbert, and the 52-year-old bookkeeper, Beverly Guy, who was actually the owner of the shop's mother. So they were all found shot dead from multiple gunshot wounds. And like I said, that case hadn't been solved for 13 years. But in the 2016 interrogation, Todd confessed. He said that he had bought a motorcycle from that specific shop, and then two weeks later, that motorcycle went missing. Todd had actually purchased a motorcycle from this particular bike shop, and a couple days later, he realized that he made the wrong decision, according to him. He said that he didn't know how to ride a motorcycle, or at least he didn't know how to ride that type of motorcycle. So he ended up going back to the shop and asking the people in there, if he could return it or exchange it or get a new bike. And according to him, the employees of this shop started making fun of the fact that he couldn't ride a bike. And for someone who thrives off of praise and attention, getting made fun of and being belittled is the worst thing they could have done to someone like Todd. About a couple days after he went in trying to exchange the bike, Todd's motorcycle actually ended up getting stolen and Todd was convinced that the employees were the ones who stole the bike. He said that they knew exactly where the bike was because they had dropped it off and that coupled with the fact that they were making fun of him for not being able to ride it meant to him that they were the ones that stole it. Todd said the more that he thought about all of this, the angrier he got and he knew that he had to do something about it. So what Todd ended up doing was he loaded a gun and walked back into the motorcycle shop. Once he got there, he said that he started looking around at the motorcycles as usual and picked out one that he told the employees that he wanted to purchase. And he said the reason he did that was so that the mechanic would take the bike into the back and start fixing it up for him. He then told police verbatim, quote, I cleared that building in 30 seconds you guys would have been proud, end quote. What Todd meant by that is that once the mechanic took the bike into the back of the shop, he followed the mechanic back and shot the mechanic at point blank range. Then the three other employees ran into the back and that is when Todd shot the mother of the owner and then proceeded to shoot the other two as well. He told police the reason that they never found any fingerprints on the scene was because he used his knuckles to open the door. And along with that, he said that he also used two pairs of latex gloves to load every firearm so that there were never any DNA prints on the shell casings. He went into detail about the fact that if you just use one latex glove, it's not going to work. But if you use two, it's untraceable. Now, at the end of the interrogation, the investigator asks Todd what he wants the outcome of his conviction to be and how he sees this proceeding. And when you listen to this interrogation, there are points where you sit there and you think these guys are acting like they're best friends and these guys are acting like this is just a casual everyday conversation. And I saw a lot of comments like that off of the interrogation. And I think it's really important to remember that these investigators 
are not stupid and this is not their first rodeo. It is a psychological tactic that they use in order to get Todd on their side and in order for Todd to open up to them and give as much detail as possible. Now, Todd said that he was planning on getting the death penalty. He was expecting the death penalty, but he said if he didn't get the death penalty, he thinks that he could go his entire life without hurting another person or killing another person. In 2017, Todd pled guilty to seven counts of murder, two counts of kidnapping, and one count of criminal sexual assault. He was sentenced to seven life sentences without the possibility of parole, plus 60 years in prison. Now, there is still believed to be more victims of Todd, and the reason to that is because he admitted it. He told his mother, as well as the Herald Journal, when writing in a letter to them, that there were way more victims that hadn't been found. His exact words to his mother when asked how many more victims there were, he said, quote unquote, you do not have enough fingers. In the letter, he said, quote, there is more than seven. I tried to tell the investigators and I did tell the FBI, but I was blown off. It's not an addition problem. It's a multiplication problem. But regardless of that statement, there is interrogation footage that shows authorities asking Todd point blank if he had killed anyone else other than those seven and he said no. Now, the idea that Todd took a 13 year break between the quadruple homicide and then the murders of Megan, Johnny, and Charles is hard to believe. It seems very unlikely to have never killed anyone in your entire life, to then killing four people all at once, to then taking 13 years off, and then to killing three more people in the span of a year. I think more than likely there are other victims of Todd and I think he didn't want to admit to them. Which is interesting when you think about the psychology of Todd because he is someone that thrives on the attention and throughout the interrogation it was obvious that he was loving what he was doing when telling authorities what had happened to his victims. He knew that the authorities needed him and that's what he loved. He loved the attention. He loved that the spotlight was on him. So it is interesting to wonder why wouldn't he admit to more victims if there are more. So that is the only reason that has me questioning that maybe there isn't, but I am very interested in hearing what you guys have to say about it. So that my friends is the case of Todd Colham. All right, you guys, that is all for me today. And that is the first episode of Hollow Week. Join me again tomorrow when we talk about another crazy true crime case. Make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button, whether you're listening to me on the podcast or watching me on YouTube. And make sure you go ahead and share this episode as well. The more coverage we get on these cases, the better chance these victims have at getting justice. I'll be back, like I said, tomorrow with a brand new episode. And until then, stay safe. Bye guys. Thank you guys so much for watching the first episode of Hollow Week. Join us tomorrow where we are going to be talking all about the solved case of Tim McLean, otherwise known as the Greyhound bus killings. This is definitely one of the most gruesome and disturbing cases that I have ever, ever covered and you are not going to want to miss it. So I will see you there.